Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about a generalization of Shor's period finding algorithm for the case of simple periodic functions that we saw in the last video to a more general kind of periodic function that we call almost periodic functions. And this is actually the case that we need for the application to integer factorization. Okay, so let's start off with the definition of an almost periodic function. So a function is almost periodic if there is an s such that f of 0 through f of s minus 1 are all distinct. So that's the same assumption that we had in the simple uh, periodic case. Uh, so one change here is the second condition. So now we only have that f of x is equal to f of x plus s as long as x plus s is strictly less than n. Okay, so this function may not wrap around properly, as we'll see in an example on the next slide. Um, because we have this weaker condition here, we need an additional condition, and that's that n is at least m squared. Actually, n is strictly larger than m squared. Okay, and note that s is at most m, right? Because the size of the range here is m, and all of f0 through f of s minus 1 are distinct. So s is at most m. So, you know, and one, th one thing is that this condition is telling us that we see at least s many periods. Okay. So this problem becomes hard quantumly, uh, you know, if we only see a couple periods of the function. So we need to see a sufficient number of periods of the function in order to learn S by a quantum algorithm. Okay, so this is the, the kind of function that we're going to work with in this segment. And this, is, um, this suffices for the application to integer factorization. Okay, let's look at an example. So here's an, an almost periodic function uh, where N is seven. So you see the function is red, blue, green, red, blue, green, red. Uh, and in this case, s is 3. So note that s does not divide n like we had in the simple periodic case. right? And that means that the function does not wrap around properly. right? So we have that f of 4 is equal to blue but f of four plus the period three. So remember this addition is done modulo n, so modulo seven, so that's equal to f of zero, which is red. Okay, so these are no longer equal um, as in the simple period finding case. So we only guarantee that f of x is equal to f of x plus s, as long as x plus s is at most n x plus s is strictly less than n, I should say. OK, so one difference that this creates compared to the simple period finding case is that if we look at the values, the inputs where f takes on the value red uh, versus the inputs where f takes on the value blue, you see these sets do not have the same size. So here there's three numbers. Here there's just two numbers. OK, so whereas in the simple period finding case, uh, each element of the range, there were n divided by s, many elements of the domain, which took on that value. In the almost periodic case, the number of elements in the domain, which take on a particular value of the range, is going to be either the floor of n over s or the floor of n over s plus 1. OK, so this change, it doesn't really matter for the algorithm. OK, so the algorithm that we already when over in a simple period finding case, uh, it works just fine with this um, difference. OK, so here I've written a formula for LT, where LT is the number of elements of the domain that take on the same fun function value as T. OK, so it's basically just the number of x such that x mod s is equal to T. So we don't actually need to use this formula anywhere. Um, so this is not really important for us. And just keep in mind that LT is always either 
the floor of n over s or the floor over n over s plus 1. Another new difficulty arises in the almost periodic case, and this one is harder to deal with. Okay, so if we look at the set of elements of the domain, which take on the value red, for example, so 0, 3, and 6, this is not a subgroup of Z7. Okay, it's not closed under addition because 3 plus 6 is equal to 2 mod 7. Whereas in the simple periodic case, the set of elements of the domain, which took on the same value as f of 0, was always a subgroup. Okay? And basically what that means is that if you look at omega, where now omega is a primitive seventh root of unity, so if you look at omega to the powers of the elements of this set, so omega to the 0, omega cubed, and omega to the 6th, and you sum those up, uh, if the answer is no longer going to be 0, like we always had in the simple period finding case. Okay, So here I've kind of illustrated these three values, 1, omega cubed, and omega to the 6th, so you see that they're not kind of nicely spread out over the unit circle to sum to 0, like they were in the simple period finding case. Okay, and this, uh, this makes our life more difficult, but you know it turns out that um, if we do see enough periods of the function, then although this, this corresponding sum will not be zero, it will be close to zero, okay? And um, because of that, we can still make the algorithm work, okay? Okay, so the quantum part of the algorithm is exactly the same as before. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. We just start out with the uniform superposition, then we apply the oracle, so we get to this very familiar state, sum over all x, ket x, ket f of x, normalized. Okay, and as before, we're going to rewrite the state by grouping together things with the same value uh, on the function f. Okay, so we group things uh, like this. So here we have uh, ket0 plus ket3 plus ket6, because all of these map to red, ket1, ket4, plus ket4, because 1 and 4 map to blue, and ket2 plus ket5, uh, 2 and 5 both map to green. Okay? And also, analogously to before, I'm going to define this state ket gt. So this is just the sum over all x, such that x mod s is equal to t, appropriately normalized. Okay, so it used to be that our normalization factor was always uh, n divided by s. Uh, so we had here um, square root of s over square root of n. But uh, now, you know, lt is either going to be the floor of n over s or the floor of n over s plus 1. Okay, so here we have the state of our algorithm after the second step, and we just rewrite this in terms of the gt vectors. Okay, so we group together things with the same f value. Okay, so that's just rewriting the state. Now, as before, we just measure the second register. Again, this is not critical for the working of the algorithm. It just makes our analysis of the algorithm easier. Okay, so we're going to see f of t in the second register with probability lt divided by n. Uh, so this is going to be approximately 1 divided by s. Uh, it's not going to be the same for every value f of t, but that actually doesn't matter for us because the algorithm is, is totally independent of what value of uh, what value we see in the second register. Okay. So, um, so it doesn't matter that these probabilities are, are slightly different for, um, for different um, f of t's. Okay? So let's just say that uh, we see the second register uh, has value a, and let c be such that f of c is equal to a. Okay, so therefore our state now is ket gc tensored with f of c. So the final step of the quantum part of the algorithm 
is just to apply the Fourier transform to the first register and measure. Okay, and now uh, you know a really nice thing happened in the simple periodic case, which was that the Fourier transform of GC it only had non-zero amplitude on those indices y where y was of the form k times n divided by s. Okay, so now in the almost periodic case. Remember that s does not even divide n, right? So k times n over s is not even going to be an integer, OK? But what we will show is that with good probability, we will, um, when we measure fn times gc, we will get a, an, an, a y, which is actually close to k times n over s, OK? And we're going to see that this will still, still suffice for us to learn S. So here's just a visual example. OK, so this is a plot of the coefficients of the vector of the, of the Fourier transform of G0, where capital N is 525 and S is 50. So again, note that S does not divide N. OK. And we see that we still get these big spikes. OK, so we still get big spikes for integer values that are near, uh, close to k times n over s. OK, um, Okay, so that we have these big spikes. But of course, the amplitude is not 0 in between the spikes. OK, so we still have some chance of seeing an index which is not close to a number of the form k times n over s. But we will show that with good probability, you know, when we measure, we're going to get um, one of these spikes. OK, and then we, we will be seeing a number which is close to uh, k times n over s for some k. OK, so let's see more precisely what we need. OK, so call. Uh, be good if there exists a k which is relatively prime to s and such that b times s minus k times n is at most s over 2 and at least minus s over 2. Okay, so you see that this means that b is close to k times n divided by s. OK, so basically b is within a half on either side of k times n over s. OK, so that's, you know, that's exactly what we are seeing in this picture. You know, k times n over s is no longer an, an integer, but we see spikes in probability at integers which are very close to k times n over s. OK. Um, so we want it to be close to k times n over s, and we also have this additional property that uh, is close to k times n over s for a k which is relatively prime to s. OK. So what you can show is that when you measure the Fourier transform of gt, again, independently of what t is, you will find a good b with probability at least 1 over 100 log log s. OK, so this lemma is a little bit technical, and I'm going to postpone this to a future video. But what I'm going to show in this video is that if you do measure and you see a good B, then you're done. OK, so then even classically in polynomial time, you can compute S. OK, so that's what we're going to focus on in this video. and. Once we have that, then you know, using this lemma, we can just repeat the quantum algorithm, the quantum part of the algorithm, you know, order log log s many times, so that with constant probability, uh, this this lemma tells us that we will see a good b in doing that. Okay, and then whenever we we do see a good b, uh, then we can compute s. Okay, so. Now let's focus on showing that if we measure and see a good b, then we can actually compute s. OK? So the first step, I'm just going to take this inequality here, and I'm going to divide both sides by s times n. 
Okay, so um, if B satisfies this inequality, then it tells us that B divided by N minus K divided by S in absolute value is at most one over two N, okay? And also recall, we have this assumption that S and K are relatively prime. So that means that K divided by S here is a fraction in lowest terms. Okay, so now what we claim is that k divided by s is the unique rational number whose denominator is at most m that is within 1 divided by 2n of the number b divided by n. Okay, so um, remember that we know that s is at most m, right, because we know that the size of the, um, the range is m, and f of 0 through f of s minus 1 take on distinct values. Okay, so n must be bigger than s, at least as big as s. Okay, and again, kind of recall the high-level idea of what's going on. So we, uh, we measure the final state of the quantum algorithm. We get some b. Now we're assuming that b is good. Um, so we know b, we know n, so that means that we can compute uh, b divided by n, okay? And now, like, given this claim that k divided by s is the unique rational number uh, with the denominator at most m that is within 1 over 2 times n of b divided by n, that gives us a path to finding s, right? Because we know b divided by n, then we just look for a rational number with denominator at most m that is within 1 divided by 2n from this number that we know, right, b divided by n, okay? And what this claim is saying is that that number must be k divided by s. And since k divided by s is in lowest terms, then, um, you know, we can actually compute what s is uh, by finding that rational number. Okay, so just pictorially, you know, again, what do we have? We know b divided by n uh, because b is good, uh, we know that there's this k over s, which is um, 1 over 2 to the n close to it. Okay, so this distance here is 1 over 2 divided by 1 over 2 n. Okay, and now what I'm going to show is that any other rational number with denominator at most m is at least 1 divided by n far away from k over s, okay? So it's at least 1 over n far away, any other rational number. So uh, if it's 1 over n far away, then, you know, it's going to have to go outside of this window, right? It's going to have to be somewhere uh, over here, so outside of our little interval here. So therefore, it cannot, cannot be within 1 divided by 2n of b divided by n. Okay, so that will show the claim. Okay, so that's what we have to do now. Um, we have to show that any other rational number with denominator at most m is 1 over n far away from k divided by s. Okay, so let uh, k prime divided by s prime be another rational number, and suppose that s prime is at most m. So we look at the difference uh, here with k divided by s. I just make a common denominator here. And now we know that, you know, this, this numerator is a difference of, of two integers and the product is not the same. Uh, k times s prime is not equal to k prime times s. So this numerator here is at least one. So this is at least one divided by s times s prime. And now we know that s and s prime are both at most m. So this is greater than one over m squared. Okay, so this, this is saying that any other rational number with denominator at most m must be at least 1 over n squared far away from k divided by s. Okay, but now we use the third condition of being an almost periodic function, right? So that third condition said that n was strictly bigger than n squared. So that means that 1 over m squared is strictly bigger than 1 divided by n. Okay, and that's, that's what we wanted to show here. Okay?
OK, so that means that we can follow this plan. And now the uh, remaining thing that we have to do is to, you know, given b divided by n, we actually want to find a rational number that is 1 over 2 divided by n close to it and whose denominator is at most n. OK, so if we can do that, now we're done. So let's see how we can do that. OK, so we can actually express this, the conditions that we want as linear equations. OK, so we want to find a k prime and s prime. So s prime is going to be the denominator now. So such that s prime is at most m. OK, so that's the first condition that we want. And then we want that k prime divided by s prime. Um, so we want that k prime divided by s prime, you know, minus b over n. b over n are both things that we know. So we want that this is less than or equal to 1 over 2n. OK, so I can equivalently express this in terms of these two equations here. OK. So what I've done here is I've basically expressed uh, the conditions that k prime over s prime minus b divided by n in absolute value is at most 1 over 2 to the 1 over 2n. And you know this denominator, s prime is at most m, as some integral linear equations. Okay, and we basically want to see if there exists a solution to these integral linear equations. Okay. So this is actually then uh, an integer linear program. Okay, so I just want to see if there exists integers k prime and s prime which satisfy these uh, linear equations. Okay, and it's actually known that an integer linear program and two variables can be solved classically in order log n time. Okay, so this is a result of Lindstra. Okay, so we can uh, just invoke this result to conclude that we can determine, you know, if there exists uh, k prime and s prime, which satisfy these linear equations. So in other words, a rational number uh, that can be expressed as a fraction whose de where the denominator is at most m, and that is 1 over 2n close to b divided by n, we can determine if there exists such a rational number in order log n time. OK, so this, uh, you know, particular uh, optimization problem, you don't have to invoke such a heavy hammer as integer linear programming. In this particular case, it can also be solved efficiently via continued fraction expansion. OK, and um, there'll be a problem about how you can do that in, in problem set two. So you can also see that alternative approach. OK, so let me just summarize what we've shown. Um, so if f is a function from the integers modulo n uh, to the set 0 through n minus 1, with the promise that there's an s such that f of 0 through f of s minus 1 are all distinct, and f of x equals f of x plus s, as long as x plus s is at most n, and n is strictly bigger than m squared, so this is what we call an almost periodic function. Then there's a quantum algorithm that finds s with constant probability after order log n squared times log log n many operations and order log log n queries to the function f. Okay, so again, where does the log log n come from? Well, that's the number of times that we have to repeat the quantum procedure in order to guarantee that with constant probability, we will find a good B, OK? And then once we saw a good B, uh, you know, then we can actually compute S in time order log n. OK, so that's the number of times we repeat the quantum part of the algorithm. And then in the quantum part of the algorithm, uh, you know, just doing it one time, the cost is about order log n squared. That's just the cost of the, uh, of the Fourier transform. OK, and each run of the quantum part of the algorithm, we just make one query to the function f. 
So overall, we make order log login queries, and the total running time is order log n squared times log login.